What is up, guys, and welcome back to another episode of the Bleeding BNG Podcast, episode 120. And if you're checking this out on YouTube, be sure to comment, be sure to like, be sure to subscribe. We're on the road to 2,000 followers. I'm trying to get there before training camp, so go ahead, help me out, help a brother out, hit that subscribe button. But you know, once you do that, you're going to get the most raw, uncut, and unfiltered analysis on the Washington Commanders and the best content on the Washington Commanders as well. But without further ado, let's get into this episode. And to give you a timestamp, as I do for all of my episodes, today is Thursday, May 2nd, 2024. And we are a week removed from the 2024 NFL Draft where the Washington Commanders put the league on notice. The Washington Commanders put the league on notice. They set league circles on fire with their 2024 draft class. And if you're following the channel and if you're a Bleed and BNG faithful um, member, you know that we did our instant reaction last Friday to our Jaden Daniels um, selection, um, which was on day one of the NFL draft. But I didn't get a chance to recap the entire draft class. Um, I got sick. I'm traveling back from my grandmother's funeral, um, and I was down bad. Your boy was down bad. Um, But I did want the opportunity to recap the entire draft class. If you haven't already heard our thoughts on Jaden Daniels, go ahead and check our last video where we gave our instant analysis, our instant reaction on the draft selection of Jaden Daniels. I'll be sure to pin that at the top of uh, these comments. But... I know everybody has recapped. I know everybody in the Washington Commanders content creator community. I know they they have recapped the draft already. And instead of regurgitating their thoughts, because, you know, they do a hell of a job. They do a hell of a job and they beat me to it. I wanted to, um, you know, do something different with this episode. Because, like I said, I still wanted to give my thoughts on the entire draft class. But today we're going to be ranking. We're going to be ranking the Washington Commanders uh, draft class, ranking the rookies based off of Bleeding B&G's projected impact in their rookie season. So I don't know if it's that, that's a tongue twister. I don't know if I just put you through mental gymnastics. So let me break that down into layman terms. So the Washington Commanders, they, they had nine picks throughout the three days of the draft, um, culminating into their entire draft class. And we're going to be ranking these guys in decrescendo order from nine to one. And what we are projecting, their projected impact to be um, for their rookie year. Uh, and it's not going to necessarily fall in line with where they were drafted. So no, um, you know, uh, who, who was Mikey Sanders? No, Johnny Newton, you know, just because he was our second um, draft pick or our second highest draft pick being drafted with the second round. That doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to be ranked number two on our list uh, because this is bleeding BNG's um, projection for the impact that the rookies will be making in the 2024 season. So shout out to the RES boys like my man Rio Robinson um, has acclaimed them or has um, self-proclaimed them. Um, Washington has the most athletic draft class in the entire league and um, when you talk about in terms of raw athletic score, um, RES score. So my man Rio draw, uh, deemed them the RES boys. And without further ado, let's get into this list of the RAS boys and our ranking over here at Bleeding BNG for the projected impact that each rookie will make in the 2024 um, draft class. So I'm going to go ahead and give you my ranking. I'm going to give you the name. I'm going to give you some talking points on why that name fell on where it did on the list. And then we're going to move on and get you guys out of here. Thank you guys for tuning in once again. Um, so for number nine, number nine, our list stays pretty chalk. Our list stays pretty chalk with the defensive end, Javante Jean Baptiste who was our round seventh pick 222. He was our last pick in the entire draft class coming from Ohio State and Notre Dame. Um, and like I said, I know this one is Chuck. Um, and the reason that, you know, he is number nine on our list, that's not necessarily saying that we're low on a guy like Javante Jean Baptiste. No diddy. Pause. Uh, but there's some reasons why we think that he's not going to have the impact that some of these guys are going to have in the 2024 season. Some of these reasons are he's a developmental player, right? He's pretty light in the ass at 6'5", 239 pounds. And he wasn't necessarily the most productive player in college, right? Uh, but if you look at his RES scores, and this is a reason why, you know, the theme... My man Rio called him the RES boys because even with the pick 222nd um, pick in the 2024 draft, our last pick in the draft class, Javon Jean Baptiste has some athletic traits uh, that you really just can't teach. Some some freakish athletic traits 
as far as, you know, his shuttle times and things like that, his 10-yard split and things like that, that you just can't necessarily teach despite him not necessarily being the most productive player. Um, while he doesn't necessarily have all the measurables, uh, 6'5 frame, if we could pack on about 15 pounds to this 240-pound frame, this is why I call him a developmental player. This is the type of guy that you spend um, a year on the practice squad, balking up um, where he can, you know, Gain that type of, you know, experience, gain that type of knowledge, gain that type of coaching and put it all together where he's no longer a project anymore. He's a full fledged football player. And that's my expectation for Javante Jean Baptiste um, high end. Um, that's my realistic expectation. A stretch uh, goal or a high end goal for Javante Jean Baptiste is that he could push Andre Jones Jr. for a back end of the roster type position. Um, Andre Jones Jr. was our seventh round pass rusher um, that we drafted in the 2023 draft. And I can see a scenario where these two guys are battling for the last pass rusher, the last defensive end. Um, spot on the final 53 when we break camp before the season. I think that KJ Henry has shown a little bit more than Andre Jones and I think that um, he has a lot of potential there and I think that best case scenario for a guy like Javante Jean Baptiste in his rookie season in 2024 season is to be competing with a guy like Andre Jones Jr. Uh, for that last defensive end roster spot on the final 53. Um, worst case scenario which I don't like putting the word worst case on it but our more realistic scenario is that, you know, he develops on the practice squad. And, you know, the way that the NFL is treating the practice squad nowadays in 2024, you can plug guys on and off the practice squad. Um, so that's something that I think that we might be doing with Javante Jean Baptiste. Depending on if we're competing in December, we can pluck him off and, you know, let him um, get his feet wet in the last couple of games. So that was number nine. On our ranking of the project, being bleeding G's projection of the most impactful rookies in the 2024 season. Moving on to number eight. Moving on to number eight. This is where we break chalk a little bit. And we have linebacker Jordan McGee. He was our fifth round pick with pick 139. And he's a linebacker out of Temple. Now, let me tell you this. I heard an interview from Jordan McGee yesterday. Um, I think he was on Chris Russell's show with Linnell Winderham. And Jordan McGee is now one of my favorite Washington Commanders. Um, that interview, you can just tell that he eat, eats, breathes, and sleeps football. And that's my type of football play. And I think that's something that Dan Quinn and Adam Peters saw. And that's something that uh, allowed him to earn the Commanders tag, as Adam Peters called it when he was calling these guys throughout the draft process. Um, the reason that Jordan McGee is so low on my list, or is number eight on my list, is because... He's gonna be sitting. He's gonna be fighting for snaps, right? The the probably the biggest thing um, or the most turnover on the roster for a position since Ron Rivera and those those boys was kicked out of town uh, when Dan Quinn and um, Adam Peters were infiltrating their vision onto this roster is they completely revamped the linebacker position. We got the likes of Bobby Wagner. We got the likes of Frankie Louvre. We got the likes of Mikhail Walker. Um, now in our linebacker room, and you infiltrate that room with a guy like Jordan McGee, and he's simply going to be fighting for a lot of snaps. But we know what Bobby Wagner is, the best inside linebacker uh, of this generation, even though he's a little past his prime. You know he's going to be getting his snaps, even if it's forced. Think of like Tom, what Ron Rivera was doing with Thomas Davis in 2020. Just forcing him out there, even though he may not have it, just simply to let the boys know, like, this is how you do it. This is how you uh, are supposed to approach a football game down in and down out. So you know Bobby Wagner is going to get his snaps. Frankie Louvu might be one of the best players on this team. So I don't see him leaving the field much um, at all because of his coverage prowess as well as his pass rushing prowess rushing from that off backer position. Uh, and then Jamin Davis is in a contract year. They just declined his fifth year option. I think it was the day of the draft or the day before the draft. So he's um, essentially in a contract year. Um, so, you know, he's going to be playing for snaps. And I think that he's going to be playing with his hair on fire. Because I think you guys know we Jamin Davis has some talent. I don't necessarily think he's the greatest football player, but there's something there with Jamin Davis as far as a run and hit linebacker. And I think that Adam Peters and Dan Quinn might, oh, not Adam Peters, Joe Witt and Dan Quinn might unlock something in Jamin Davis this year. Um, but they put him on the clock, declining his fifth year option. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that. 
but I do think that Jordan McGee will contribute when he's on the field. This is a guy that's 6'1", 228 pounds. And I heard that, um, or I listened to Logan Paulson on the Take Command podcast. He didn't comp him to the skill set, but he said that he follows the Fred Warner type of architect as like a prototypical coverage linebacker. This is a guy who's an athletic freak that ran a 4'5", 455 40. I mean, he tested um, top five in all the athletic testing throughout the pre-draft process. So what that tells you, what that tells you is that at the very least, he's going to contribute uh, on special teams. Because can you imagine uh, a, a fucking ball of clay, six foot one, two hundred twenty-eight pounds, running a full five forty, coming down to crack your fucking skull on kickoff? Especially with the new kickoff returns and the new special edge, uh, special teams uh, returns, we're looking to get any edge um, as possible. And I think that a guy like Jordan McGee with his profile can be an instant contributor on teams. And then he also has the versatility when they asked him in his post-draft call the day he got drafted when he talked to the media, his post-draft av- uh, availability. They asked about, you know, what did he see his role in? And he mentioned the capability of playing both the mic and the will. So with that versatility, that can allow him to, you know, be a backup in uh, multiple positions to increase his likelihood of getting on the field as well. So number eight on our list is Jordan McGee. Moving on. Moving on to number seven on our list. Another day two pick. Wide receiver Luke McCaffrey from Rice. He was our round three pick. He was pick 100, and he was the pick to close out the third round. So I know you guys are looking like, whoa, that's rather that's rather low for Luke because I think Luke was a, what our fifth um, highest draft pick as far as the draft class goes. And I, I have a lot of promise for Luke uh, as far as especially as you know his career works down the line and things of that nature. But some of the reasons that you know he falls number seven on his list is that he's raw. He's very raw. Um, no diddy he, um, at wide receiver only playing two years this is a guy that played quarterback he played some halfback at um, in his prior time in, in his prior college experience at Nebraska and he's going to be fighting for targets he's going to be fighting for targets with a guy like Terry McLaurin who I think is really trying to prove now that with an elite quarterback talent like Jamin Davis I mean Jaden Daniels excuse me the wrong JD um, with elite quarterback talent like Jaden Daniels I think that Terry McLaurin is going to be proving or wanting to be out to prove that, yeah, I'm a top 10 wide receiver. Because a lot of us, we can admit, myself included, um, question that um, throughout the 2023 season, even though the quarterback play wasn't there. And the quarterback play hasn't necessarily been there for Terry's entire career. So I think that now with um, a guy that inarguably has the most talent at the quarterback position that Terry McLaurin has ever played with. I think that he's going to want to show off. Jahan Dotson, I don't know what is what to make out of Jahan Dotson. I told you last year, Jahan Dotson was out there motherfucking getting clapped. I think we were the first ones to tell you that. But I know that he's going to want to break out. Now, is he capable of doing that? I'm not sure. But I know that he's going to be competing for targets with a guy like Luke McCaffrey. Um, but, you know, I, another reason why... I don't think that he's going to be as productive in his rookie season. Is that I think we're going to be having a run-heavy offense, guys. I definitely think we're going to be a run-heavy offense. I definitely think we're going to allow Jaden to, you know, spray the ball across the field um, and get the ball out of his hands and let his receivers make plays. But I think that Terry McLaurin and Jahan Dotson are going to be competing with Luke McCaffrey for limited targets. I think we're going to emphasize Jaden's ability uh, to use his legs, especially while he can be an older quarterback. Um, coming in at, at his age 23 season. I think we're going to try to get the best out of his legs um, as much as we can early in his career to allow him to develop as a passer. And not only that, I think that, you know, bringing in the two running back set with a guy like Austin Eckler and Brian Robinson. And if you just look along the lines, along um, look along the um, offensive line with uh, some of the free agency acquisitions that they bought in. They bought in a lot of wide bodies that I think are going to be leaning on people like a guy like Tyler Biotis, like a guy like Nick Allegretti. Um, I think that these guys are going to be actually running the ball. So I think that Luke uh, McCaffrey, listen here, I definitely think Luke McCaffrey is going to contribute in his rookie season because the bloodlines are elite. The bloodlines are fucking elite. He's a McCaffrey. Like what more can you say than he's a McCaffrey? Right. Um, this is a guy that you know is going to work hard. This is a guy that you know is going to grind. And this is a guy that you know is going to get the nuances on and off the field of the NFL from his father and his brothers that have been playing football since football was damn near vintage, starting with Ed McCaffrey. 
So you know he's going to get the, you know, prerequisite tools and the prerequisite knowledge to be a co contributor on the field. And not only that, I think he has the uh, capabilities of playing at a lot of different spots as well. He can, you know, play the big slot role. He can play outside on the boundary. He can line up in the backfield for a gadget type play if C Cliff Clings Cliff. Kingsbury is filling up freaky every now and then. He can give you that type of capability. He can line up in the backfield and run the ball. He can line up in the backfield and throw the ball. Um, so I think that he is going to make some plays. He just falls number seven on our list. Falling number six on our list. Moving on up to the east side. Moving on up the Bleeding B&G's list is safety Dominique Hampton from the University of Washington. He was our round five pick. Pick 161. And the reason why I think that, you know, Dominique Hampton is going to have an impact as a rookie, one is that just like when I mentioned in Jaden Daniels and his age and things of that nature, Dom Hampton is a six-year senior, right? He's going to be coming into his age 24 season. So I think that we're going to be trying to get the most out of him as we can. What does the NFL stand for? Not for long. So we'll be a fool to think that Dom Hampton is going to have this 13-year career uh, coming in as a 24-year-old safety, right? But guess what? That's why you get the most out of him as you can on his rookie contract. No diddy. Pause. No diddy. But one of the reasons why I'm very high on, you know, Do uh, Dominique Hampton's prospects um, as, you know, being a potential um, game changer or game wrecker in the 2024 season, in his rookie season, is that when you think of Dan Quinn defenses, what do you think of? You think of the Legion of Boom, you think of Cover 3, you think of causing turnovers and things of that nature. But one thing that is a staple of all Dan Quinn defenses is a safety that, a, a big in the box safety that plays close to the line of scrimmage, that can cosplay as a linebacker, that can not only knock your fucking head off, but can play in the boxes, uh, can play box coverage as well. Think of the likes of a Javon Curse, a J. Ron Curse with the Dallas Cowboys. Think of the likes of a Keanu Neal when Dan Quinn was coaching with the Atlanta Falcons. Think of the likes of a Cam Chancellor when he had that damn near the greatest secondary ever um, with the Legion of Boom over there in Seattle. Dan Quinn loves himself some big safeties. And Adam Peters went out and got him a big safety in Dominique Hampton. 6'2", 2, 215 pounds, running a 4'4", 540. So that shows you that he's going to have sideline to sideline in the box speed. I'm not. I I don't know how much I necessarily want him playing in the post. Um, from the little film that I watched, that didn't necessarily seem to be his strong suit. But you saw him shadowing um, JJ McCarthy in the uh, championship game. He has that type of athletic ability, and he has the skill set that Dan Quinn looks for in a big safety. Um, he has the, uh, like I said, he has inside the box range. Um, he's a hell of a tackler. He led the Washington Huskies, who was the uh, national championship runner-ups in tackles as a third-line defender playing the safety position. So that shows you the type of work that he does towards the line of scrimmage and in the box. And I think that he can cosplay um, as well in the box as a tight end eraser role with those type of measurables as well. At 6'2", 215 pounds, he can line up with most tight ends. Um, in the NFL and not be at a uh, athletic or size disadvantage at all. So um, those are the reasons why I think that Dom Hampton will contribute as a rookie. Now we're moving on to number five on our list. Stay with me. Stay with me. I'm hope. I hope that you. I hope that you're getting all this knowledge and all this insight that I'm dropping on you. And I hope that you're getting more acclimated with the 2024 Washington Commanders draft class because I do think that this is the type of draft class that could potentially. Um, you know, turn the entire organization um, around and, you know, on the way to winning pastures. So moving on to number five, we have tight end halfback Ben Sinat from Kansas State. He was our round two pick. He was pick 53. So he was our third, second round pick. Um, and he was our fourth highest pick overall. And Ben Sinat might be uh, Ben Sinat. Excuse me. His name is Ben Sinat. Um, he might be my favorite pick outside of Jaden Daniels in the entire class. Uh, as soon as the pick was made, uh, because of, you know, you know, we, we in the books, we in the film, we in the weeds watching film, um, throughout the draft process, we were very familiar with Ben Sinek's game. And if you watch football, if you were an avid college football watcher and you watched Kansas State next last year, Ben Sinek stood out like a sore thumb. We were like, who is this Chris Cooley looking mofo that is carrying Kansas State's offense? Kansas State was a damn good, 
um, you know, team in 2022 riding um, behind Deuce Vaughn. But guess what? They didn't have a running back of the likes of Deuce Vaughn in 2023. That entire offense ran through the likes of Ben Sin Sinnott. And then when you hear a guy like Adam Peters and his call to Ben Sinnott um, after the draft selection was made, he told Ben, he said, yeah, man. He didn't necessarily say how, but he said, yeah, man, you remind me of a couple of guys that I had in San Francisco in George and Juice, referencing um, um, Kyle Juice and George Kittle. And to be honest, and I tweeted this as well, and I know this might sound hot, like hyperbole, but I think that that's the perfect comp for Ben Sennett. I think that he's 50% Kyle Juice He's 50% George Kittle. Matter of fact, scratch that, scratch that, scratch that. He's 45% Kyle Juszczyk. He's 45% George Kittle with 10% Chris Cooley in there. We, you know, we got to give him some Washington ties. And I said that Ben Sennett is 2024's version of what Joe Gibbs would have had a, uh, 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 his, his 2024 version of an H-back. Ben Sennett is a guy, he's going to be lining up in, inside the backfield. He's going to be lining up in the slot. You might see him out wide. On a goal line package, if like I said, if Cliff is feeling frisky that day, um, and he gives you the skill versatility to attack a lot of base coverages um, with you know disguising a lot of personnel, he can make twelve personnel look like eleven personnel, look like thirteen personnel just based off of his alignment, and he has that capability. Um, as I mentioned with his player comp, the 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 George Kittle and the Kyle Juice player comp that was perfect. Um, to a T because he's a met he's a better move blocker than George Kittle in my opinion at this rate in his career and he's a better downfield threat in the past game than Kyle Juszczyk so when you mix those up when you mix those guys together you get Ben Sennett so I don't know if you want to call him the love child of George Kittle and Kyle Juszczyk but I think that Ben Sennett is going to have a hell of a career uh and number five on that list shows that I have I think he's going to have a lot of promise um, and have an instant impact as a rookie. So moving up on our list, number four. Number four on our list was our second highest overall draft pick of the entire draft class. And that was defensive tackle Johnny Newton from Illinois, um, who was round two, pick 36. And many people believe that he was a first round talent. Many people believe, most draft pundits believe that he was a first round talent. And I'm going to go out and say this now. So if you want to go ahead and clip this, if you're watching this on YouTube, want to go ahead and clip this, put this on social media, or uh, give it the freezing cold takes if I end up wrong. But Johnny Newton might very well end up being the best player for the Washington Commanders in this entire draft class. Jaden Daniels included. He has that type of talent. He has that type of talent. He has first round talent. He should have went in the first round. I don't know if it was the Jones fracture. I don't know. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it's the fact that he's not 6'5 and he's only 6'2. But Geno, I can show you how he hasn't mattered at the defensive tackle position. Aaron Donald is showing you how he hasn't mattered at the defensive tackle position. Ed Oliver is showing you how he hasn't mattered at the defensive tackle position. And I think that these are some of the best comps. I try to fall short of the Aaron Donald um, comparisons because he might be the best defensive player that I've ever seen with my own two eyes. But those are some similar comps for a guy like Johnny Newton. The, the only reason, the only reason that he is falling number four on my list and not number two is that he's going to be fighting for snaps with two of the best players on the team. And Jonathan Allen and Deron Payne. No matter how you feel about them after the 2023 season, with the 30 players that we done bought in throughout free agency and the draft, as it stands now, on Thursday, May 2nd, 2024, Deron Payne and Jonathan Allen are still two of the best players on this team. I hate to break it to you. <coughs> so he's going to be fighting for snaps with those guys. And defensive tackle is a rotational role as is. So he's not going to be playing as many snaps as some of these guys on the list. Um, and he's going to be playing behind some dogs. He's going to be playing behind some dogs. So when he does get on the field, he's going to be made, he's going to have for him to move or be high on this list, he's going to be having to have some damn, some damn near perfect, efficient play. He's going to be having to make plays in the limited steps that he gets to be anywhere higher on this list. And while I think that he's a elite prospect, he can, he can, you know, 
Um, he he can benefit from adding strength, definitely to his core and things like that. He's a shoot the gap type of lineman, like the guys that I previously comped him to. Um, he doesn't necessarily hold up the spot in the run game. He can get moved off of his spot in the run game. So if he spends this year, you know, adding that strength while being a rotational interior pass rush presence, he can hit the Johnny Newton was a 2025 pick. I think that he can be a pro bowler as soon as 2025 with the year with the NFL weight program and things of that nature. Um, and yeah, number four on our list, Johnny Newton. So now moving on to the top three on our list. Moving on to our top three. Number three on our list. Mikey, my boy Mikey Sastro, cornerback from the University of Michigan, second round pick, pick 50. He was our second uh, our second pick in the second round. He was our third overall pick, and he ends up third overall on this list. Um, I think that Mikey Sandra still is gonna Sandra still is gonna make an impact from day one. When Mikey Sandra still was drafted, go ahead and check my Twitter, check my X page. I said that. He's the best cornerback on the roster right now. And I meant every word of that shit. Now, I know that Adam Peters um, said that, you know, they're going to be projecting him to play that, you know, slot role, that slot position. And guess what? That's why he's high on the list. He has the clear role as the starting nickel corner on his team. And then when I was watching the draft party with my guys Tay and Todd and Rio Robinson and things of that nature, I said, man, after round one, I said, man, I want I want Mikey. I want Mikey Sanford still. That's, that's the corner that I want. And Rio was like, man, he's small, though. He's small. Can he play? Yes. And, and he's primarily a slot corner. But like I told Rio Robinson that night, shout out to my guy Rio Robinson. Go ahead and subscribe if you haven't. Mikey Sanford still can play all five positions. You saw him play the boundary cornerback against the University of Maryland in 2023. If you're a real college football fan, like we are over here at Bleeding B&G, and what did he do in that game? Playing a boundary sideline corner. Bam, two interceptions. Go to sleep. About to lead a tackle below and go to sleep. Ball game. Blouses. This is a guy that can play all five positions. I think he can play every position that he, he can play any position that he wants on a football field. Nick Saban told you he was pound for pound the best player in the football in the entire NFL draft. The best football player in the entire NFL draft. The only reason that he fell to pick 50 is that he's 5'9", 185 pounds. That's why we got to put disclaimers like pound for pound. Because I think that Mikey Sanders still might be the best football players on this roster right now. Overall football players, he might be in the top 10 today. That's how talented this type of guy is. And you can tell he's a student of the game. He's a student of the game. Look at his instincts. He had six interceptions this past season. Um, and a lot of it was just based off knowing route concepts and things of that nature. Being a former wide receiver. And this is one of the reasons why I think that he can come in and make a huge contribution as well. Because he can contribute to all phases of the game. This is a guy that came in um, to the University of Michigan as one of their best wide receivers. Adam Peters told you at the pro day, he ran routes better than the wide receivers that were there. I already mentioned what he's going to be doing on defense. And this is the guy that he's so good of a motherfucking football player. He's such an elite football player that if you wanted him to go back there and return punts, he could be damn good at that too. He could be damn good at that too because he did it um, and he had flashes of it when he was on the offensive side of the ball at Michigan. Now, Michigan is the type of school they have a dedicated returner and things of that nature. So when he slid, slid over to the defensive side of the ball, he didn't necessarily contribute in special teams in the return game as much. But guess what? Coming from somebody that's that's been watching Washington, Washington football return game for quite some time, um, you, you ain't going to be fighting for too many people. Um, you ain't going to have too much competition. Um, as a return a punt return specialist on this roster. I don't know when the last time I seen a punt return. Uh, oh, Jameson. Oh, no. Not Jameson Crowder because he got hogged in. He got hogged in. It was a good run, but Mikey, Mikey Sanders, though, I promise you, he not going to get hogged like Jameson Crowder did against the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, but, yeah, we're, we're very high on Mikey Sanders still um, just because he's simply that good of a football player. All right, as we move on, getting closer and closer to the end of our list, 
Moving on to number two on our list. Number two is Brandon Coleman, left tackle from TCU. He was a third round pick. He was pick 67. And even though, even though, so I think I mentioned that Luke McCaffrey was our fifth pick. Luke McCaffrey was actually our sixth pick, sixth pick um, in our overall draft class. Even though Brandon Coleman falls number five overall in our fifth highest pick in the Washington Commanders draft class, the reason that he falls number two on this Bleeded BNG's list is that he plays one of the big four spots as far as positional value. He plays one of the sweet four, the big four. If you guys follow football, you know that the quarterback position, the left tackle position, the cornerback position, and the edge rusher or the pass rusher position are the most valuable positions in football. The quarterback is the leader of the team. Your left tackle protects your quarterback. Your quarterback is tasked to make the job as possible, as hard as possible for that quarterback, and that pass rusher is tasked to not only fuck up that left tackle, but to get to that quarterback as well. Those are why those are the four most valuable positions um, on the football field, on a football roster, and Brandon Coleman happens to play that. I know he played left uh, guard majority of the time in the 2023 um, season. But me personally, I think that he's a left tackle. If you go back and look at some of his 2022 film, he played left tackle um, at a damn good, um, you know, at a damn good rate um, playing on the team that ended up losing, um, getting blown out in the national championship game. But he was the left tackle for the national championship runner ups in the 2022 season. Um, and if you look at the way that he played guard, um, I think that he plays guard like a tackle. Um, a lot of his sets in the senior bowl, he was taking steps back and things of that nature. Um, you don't necessarily want to do that all the time at um, the guard position. And Adam Peters mentioned that they like him at tackle. And in Adam Peters, we trust. So if Adam Peters thinks that he can be a tackle, us over here at Bleeding B&G think he can be a tackle as well. Just to give you some reasons... Um, not only just because Adam said so, but this is a guy that had a 9.97 raw athletic score as a guard. I think it was ticked down just a tad bit, but it's still in the nines as an offensive tackle. So he has the elite elite athleticism to play that left tackle position. And he also has the measurables at 6'4". While he might not have the ideal 6'6", 6'7", um, 6'7", inch frame, he has 35 inch arms like a 6'6", 6'7", inch frame. So he has ideal measurables for the position. He has experience playing over 1,600 snaps at left tackle. And he doesn't have much competition. Because as of right now, Andrew Wiley and Cornelius Lucas are your starting tackles as of May 2nd, 2024. And just saying that last sentence made me want to damn near puke in my fucking mouth. So if the guys that you got to beat out are Cornelius Lucas and Andrew Wiley... I like Brandon Coleman's chances. I like Brandon Coleman's chances. So not only is he at one of the most valuable positions on the field, but he has a clear role to see in some early playing time. This is the reason why he falls number two on our list. And are you ready? Thank you guys. Thank you guys for tuning into this entire list. We have finally made it to number one. And without further ado, without bur- don't want to bury the lead. Number one. Is the reigning Heisman winner, is the number two overall pick, is the guy that is tasked to turn the Washington franchise around. Don't want to put too much on him, but the savior of the franchise, um, the franchise QB, um, all hell QB one, Jaden Daniels. Um, so, yes, number one on the list is Jaden Daniels, the reigning Heisman winner. And quite simply being that he plays the most important position In the sport. Not only in the sport of football. He plays the most important position in sports. And that's the quarterback position. So you know we just uh, touched on positional value. Well guess what? The quarterback position is the most valuable position. Uh, Their contracts tell you. uh, Every time you know the offseason comes. And they're resetting the market every year. With these $60 million AAV uh, per year checks. And things of that nature. Getting paid like uh, real big businessmen. Uh. And, and it's the reason why, because it's the most important position in sports. And I think that this is a guy that has the elite skill set, the elite talent. Um, you know how we felt about Jaden Daniels. He was our clear um, favorite for the number two pick. He was our quarterback two in the draft, and it wasn't a huge gap between a guy like him and um, Caleb Williams. And I think that Jaden Daniels, um, 
can ultimately have a better uh, rookie year than a guy like, even like Caleb Williams, kind of like with um, how RG3 ended up winning rookie over the year over a guy like Andrew Luck, who had a tremendous rookie year as well, simply because of all the things that he did in the running game. Um, Jaden, Jaden gives you that type of skill set. Um, I think that he's a more advanced passer than Robert Griffin was. And he can give you that RG3 type impact as, in the, as a rookie. And, you know, the league loves storylines. You know, Jaden Daniels, he wore a similar suit to RG3 did in his 2012 draft. He wore a similar suit last week, the light, light blue. Um, so the league loves storylines. So is this a, a RG3 type um, of prospect? Because uh, I don't think that their games are necessarily too similar outside of them being able to be very dynamic with their legs. Uh, coming to revive um, Washington kind of like is a quasi, you know, master sensei, protege type role. Um, and doing something that Robert couldn't do, um, being Jaden Daniels, leading us to a Super Bowl and ultimately um, leading us to consistent, not only a flash in the pan one year, but consistent, consistent um, winning and consistent success in the Washington organization. So that'll do it for this list, man. Um, I know we I know we gave you a lot. I know that was a lot to digest. Pause. No ditty. Um, but you know you kind of bleed in BMG for the most raw, uncut, unfiltered, and the most insight on your Washington Commanders. And I hope that we gave that to you today. Um, as always, if you're following us on audio-only platforms like Apple Podcasts or like Spotify, please show to leave a rating. Please show to leave a review. Preferably five stars. That's how we finesse these algorithms so that when you're searching for the Washington Commanders, Bleeding B&G is number one um, in that search bar. If you're not following us on social media, on social media, if you're not following us on X, our X handle is at Bleeding B&G, at Bleeding B&G, B-L-E-E-D-I-N, B-N-G. Our Instagram handle is spelled a tad bit different. That one's at Bleeding B-N-G, B-L-E-E-D-I-N-G. B-N-G. So there's two G's in our Instagram handle. We spelled that one the proper way. Um, but let me know how you feel. Let me know what you feel about this list. Let me know who you would change. And give me your own list. Spam the comments with your own list. Give me your own rankings of, you know, your projections for the rookie class and their impact in the 2024 season. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Coming with a lot more content because um, that's the only way I'm going to get to 2K before training camp. Um, but, yeah, uh, OTA is on the way. You know, we break news over there, OTAs. We got the Washington media members over there uh, mad at us. So it's that time of year for us to break some more news over there, boots on the ground in Ashburn. So be sure to subscribe, follow the channel, um, and I'll check in on you guys later.